German theologian came to America some years ago and he had to meet uh, various crowds of theologians and others <coughs> and someone said to him how many, how many years have you studied the Bible and so he said X number of years and he said well what's the greatest discovery you've made in the Bible do you know what he said Jesus loves me this I know can we sing that <laughs> all go to Sunday school Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. <coughs> Sing it, yes. Jesus loves me, yes. Now you can go home. <laughs> Father, we thank you that we don't have to stand in the outer court, nor just in the holy place. But we thank you for the offering that was made once in the end of the age to put away sin by Jesus, by the sacrifice of himself. We thank you that because of him we have boldness to come into your holy presence tonight. We turn away from this world with all its sin and sorrow and shadows. We thank you for this oasis that you provided for us. As an old hymn writer said, if our fellowship below in Jesus be so sweet, <coughs> what heights of rapture shall we know when round his throne we meet? Lord, we bless you. We thank you for the privilege of meeting without fear of being arrested. We thank you for this holy world. You've preserved it through the ages. Men have burned it and banned it and blamed it and banished it, but it's here. We thank you, Lord, your blessed holy word stands at the graveside of all its persecutors. We thank you, Lord, you said 
that this not is not determined by the opinions of men. Thy word, O Lord, is settled in heaven. Yes. And because you settled it there, we bless you, Lord, it cannot be moved. It's going to last through all the ages. We thank you for the privilege of coming to it. We thank you for the holy men. Lord, you didn't say there were rich men or brilliant men or kings or rulers. You said that holy men of God will spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. We think of the Holy Ghost moving in the beginning over chaos and brought forth order. We think of the Holy Ghost moving over some of the Old Testament characters. We think of him moving over the womb, the empty womb of the Virgin Mary, bringing forth Jesus Christ. We think of those men in the upper room, and they came out not with swords, though they may have had power over life and death, and yet they were filled with the Holy Spirit of God. And because of that, they penetrated the darkness of their day, the dangers of their day, the devilry of their day. And in their generation, or a little after, they, the world, the whole world had heard the word of God. <coughs> Lord, we ask you tonight, as we've sung, Spirit of God, my teacher, be showing the things of Christ to me. Make this a very personal encounter, though we're a number tonight. Yes. <coughs> speak to me. One hymn writer said, Speak to me by name, O Master, let me know it is to me. Speak that I may follow faster with a step more firm and free, where the shepherd leads the flock in the shadow of the rock. Lord, we want to hear your voice. And hearing it, we'll obey. So, Lord, bless your word in Jesus' name. Okay, the epistle of Paul, <coughs> and the epistle of Paul to the Corinthians. Again in chapter 5, where we were last week. <coughs> For the moment, reading the same verse that we had in verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and all things have become new. <coughs> When I was a youngster in England, there was a very brilliant preacher filling the historic pul pulpit of John Wesley, which is on, it's at the Methodist Church on City Road, London. It's a kind of a, what do you call it now? A shrine almost. But Moffat Gautry was a man of unusual eloquence, and he said this about the Apostle Paul. Quoting someone else, actually, he said that somebody says that Paul's mind was so steeped in dogma it became a, a, a mere machine for grinding out metaphysics. If you don't know what metaphysics are, well, either see Joe Foss or the pastor after the meeting. Oh, and then it goes to Sunny. That doesn't matter. In my mind, Paul was essentially a preacher. He was not only a pe preacher, he was a poet. He's not only a poet, he's a pragmatist. In other words, he had his feet on the ground. Look at his tremendous missionary journeys. He had no plane, he had no train, and yet you see him going over well, Asia Minor. Those vast territories, through all the hazards he went through. Now here he says, again in this 17th verse, Therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and all things shall become new. Now he isn't whispering this, he isn't sitting down in one of those beautiful, what do they call them? Uh, Theatres that they had in those days? Arenas? He isn't talking to a nice bunch of quiet people. He's throwing a challenge to the world, the flesh, the devil. This word has to become real in America or we'll go to hell. It has to become, capture our hearts. There's no salvation anywhere else. Oh, there are some people today, what reconstructionists, they're going to rebuild the nation. What, on human depravity? The greatest of modern theolog uh, uh, historians, not because an Englishman, Arnold Toynbee says, remember, 19 times man has built what he calls a permanent civilization, and 19 times it's fallen down. You know, you tell your children a little story, Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall, that's deep theology. It's a satire on the fall of man, I think, Brother Basie. All the king's horses and all the king's men can't put Humpty Dumpty together again. 
What do we have now? The United Nations, what do they do? They watch the rape of, of every country in the world. They've stood by and watched a million people die in Afghanistan. They've watched wars and rumors of wars and not done a thing. Before the, United Na before the United Nations, there was the League of Nations when I was a youngster. Before that, there was a League of Nations established in The Hague in Holland. And repeatedly, men have tried to patch up and prop up civilization. But this, this is not the word of a super optimist. It's the man who has tasted so much of the grace of God and therefore he thought, any man, anywhere, at any time, can you think of anything more exciting than that? Or inspiring? If you're going to be a missionary, you better get this took well down in your heart, otherwise you'll faint, by the way. You go to a, a, a civilization, or an uncivilization. I got the letter that many of you got today, from David Wilkerson, he has his, uh, <coughs> his usual monthly letter, sordid, telling about New York, all the crime, all the wickedness, that it's a jungle. I had a young man call me a few days ago, somewhere on the outskirts of Dallas, and he said, uh, oh, I feel real urge to serve God. Great. He said, I can't make up my mind. So you see, it was his choice. I can't make my mind whether I'll go to New York or San Francisco. Where should I go? I said, Dallas. It's a bigger hell all as any of them. But it always looks so romantic. I've been to New York, I've met prostitutes, I've done this, so what? Sin is the same wherever you go. Sin in the church is worse than sin outside of the church. And this man has an answer to everybody. If any man ever twisted he is, God can untwist him. Ever polluted he is, Christ can purge him. Ever bankrupt he is, God can restore him in every part of his being. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Well, I said last week <coughs> that when Paul was in that terrible storm in the 27th chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, he said they threw out four anchors and wished for the day. And I suggested we could find four anchors in this chapter. That is, again, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning at verse 1, he says, We know if the earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God, a house not made with hands in heaven. He doesn't say that. He says eternal in the heavens. As I used to say to my Friday night class very often, I'm going to heaven, I'm not going for the weekend. <laughs> I talked one night with a man at a banquet, he said, did you ever meet my wife? I said, no. Oh, she's a wonderful woman, good for you. I heard of one man, he said, you got married since I said, yes. He said, oh, my wife. He said, my wife's an angel. He said, you're lucky, mine's still living. <laughs> <laughs> but what did he mean? He said, my wife went to heaven, and she stayed in heaven six days and came back to earth. And when she came back to life, she danced around the bedroom for six days on her tiptoes without going to sleep, without eating. Isn't that wonderful? That's crazy. What do you mean, crazy? I said, listen, once I get through the pearly gates, there isn't all the hosts of heaven not going to kick me back to this dump. <laughs> he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. And we're going to reign with him. You see that statement we sang, when Christ shall come. It's too much for the nervous, nervous stomach of our generation. We'd rather sing gentle Jesus, meek and mild. But sing, look at this first chapter in the second book of Thessalonians. He's coming in dreadful majesty. And Wesley put that in his hymn. Lo, he comes with clouds descending, once for favoured sinners slain, thousand, thousand saints attending, swell the triumph of his train. Jesus comes and comes to reign. Lo, the tokens of his passion, though in glory still he bears. And then he says, he goes on to talk about his dreadful majesty. That's going to be an awesome thing. So one thing, Paul is sure he has a home, eternal in the heavens. That's why I went through all the stuff we talked of, you remember last week, on 1 Corinthians 11. But then we mentioned another thing in passing here. <coughs> we go a little further down the, the chapter, or further back actually, verse 10. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done where? In his body. 
according or to holy earth, done whether it be good or bad. Now that's the second anchorage. The third one, I think, is in this wonderful verse 14. You know, I've heard people say, what made the Apostle Paul take it? It's not what, it's who. Here's the speaking of his life, or one of them, the love of Christ constraineth me. The love of Christ? You say I'm not quite sure if I really love the Lord. I'll tell you how to find out. Find out from this book. Look what it says in John chapter 14. <coughs> Here it is, I didn't write this. This is given by divine inspiration. John 14 and verse 21. He that keepeth my commandments and keepeth them, he that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. Got that? Nail it down. You'll keep his commandments. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. Dear God, if I said that 20 years ago in the Pentecostal church, they'd have shouted the roof off. The love of God? Overshadowed by the love of the Father? But before you enter that love, you have to leave the other love, the love of the world. If a man loves the world, the love of the Father isn't in him. He won't come to a divided heart. O oh, happy day that fix my choice on thee, my Saviour and my God. The last stanza says, now rest my long divided heart, fixed on this blissful centre rest, nor ever from thy Lord depart, with him of every good possessed. But here it is. Where were we in uh, John 14 and verse 1? 20. Was it 21? He that hath commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me, and he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father, and I will love him, I will manifest myself to him. You say he doesn't manifest himself to me, he surely doesn't, you don't love him. I almost had you sing the most popular hymn in the world that was born in America, Blessed Assurance. I didn't do that, you'll be singing lies. Why? This is my story, this is my song, praising my song, all the day long. Is that while you watch football all Sunday afternoon? Are you praising your Saviour? What are we singing? Every idle word we've sung as well as spoken we're to answer for at the judgment seat of Christ. I think the most reckless thing for a man to do today is not jump out of an aeroplane. I felt like jumping out of many of them. Particularly when they're in a storm. But it isn't a man skydiving, it isn't a man scuba, scuba diving, it isn't a deep sea diver walking on the bottom of the, earth, on the bottom of the sea. I think the most reckless thing a man can do today is say I'm a Christian in a perverted, degenerate generation in which we live. Immediately I do that, I become a target for the devil, for the world and the flesh to oppose me. Is this vile world a friend to grace, to help us unto God? No, it's not. It's opposed to every inch of the way. And while I'm there, I'm going to say this, very hard. You know, I believe if you profess to be filled with the Spirit, it's much harder to commit sin than any, for anybody else. Because further, first you should have the Word of God in you, then you should have the Holy Spirit, and He hates sin. When men go into sin, as some have done, the Word of God says what? That, that He, the Spirit, the Spirit of truth will do two things. He'll guide you into all truth. And when he is come, he'll lead you. He doesn't lead us to harlots. He doesn't lead us to sin. He hates sin. Before a man can get into that sin, he's got to do at least three things. He's got to resist the Holy Spirit. He's got to grieve the Holy Spirit. And he's got to quench the Holy Spirit. It's to fight all the opposition of the Godhead. It's an awesome thing in this day to see where Christians... It means we're Christ's ones. Well, anyhow, let me go back to that verse again. I will love him and will manifest, manifest myself to him. That's verse 22. Jesus said unto him, not his carrier, Lord, how is it that I will manifest thyself unto us and not unto the world? Jesus said, if a man love me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and we will come to him and what? Take up our abode. Sure, 
know that Jesus came into a, into a, a, a wonderful place when he came to earth? He came to a royal palace. It had wall-to-wall -wall dung. It was acrid with animal urine. It had cobwebs for curtains. It had the sweat of bees for heating. And he came there, but he doesn't come to the beast of a human heart. He cleanses it before he comes. It has to be purged. It has to be pure. It has to be clean. I and my father will come and take up our abode. What does that great 91st Psalm say? He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. The favourite hymn of our dear president when I went to a little Bible school was God is the refuge of his saints when storms of sharp distress invade ere we can offer our complaint behold him present with his aid let mountains from their seats be hurled down to the deeps and buried there convulsions shake the solid earth our faith shall never yield to fear Hallelujah. we don't fear man we don't fear the future the psalmist said, my times are in thy hands. Is there anything more glorious? My times? I'm not kicked around by every strange thing. I'm not a dead leaf blown by the wind of circumstances. I'm a personality. Hallelujah. I'm supposed to be the habitation of God. A Chinaman had read the Quran, he'd read the Vedas, he'd read every classical book on religion in the world. And he'd spent a lifetime doing it. One day somebody said, what is the greatest thing you've read in the Vedas? That doesn't matter. The Quran, it doesn't matter. A sacred book, doesn't matter. Well, what is the most amazing? The most amazing thing, you have a book, a Bible, yes. You have a book, Ephesians, yes. You have a chapter 2, yes. It begins by saying, we're in the world. And it ends by saying, oh, are you a Christian? Yes. Oh, you're, you're the most amazing person in the world. He said, what? The Christian didn't know that. It took a man from China to tell him, you're the most amazing man. Why? Because, he said, your little book says you are the habitation of God. Mm. Is another religion in the world where a man's God comes and lives inside of him? Where the Holy Spirit comes to check each thought and calm each fear and speak of heaven? Hallelujah. Where the Holy Spirit restrains me if I'm going too fast and constrains me if I'm going too slow? Dear God, what manner of person should we be? Hallelujah. Every meeting should be like a volcano. Let me go back to this little word again. He says, the love of Christ constraineth me. That reminds me, I was standing at the side of a charming lady, one of the most ugly women I've ever seen. <laughs> Dear Lord, she was ugly. I don't think she could have won a beauty competition in a crocodile farm. Do you know who she was? She was the daughter of the founder of the Salvation Army. She was 84 years of age. She came to preach at a pastor, church I pastored. And we were singing, and I looked at the congregation, and she craggy cheeks, and the tears were bouncing down the cheeks. We were singing a hymn that she wrote, and I can't remember the first verse. But one stanza was, There is a life was given me, a life divine and strong. It carries me through every sea of sorrow, storm and wrong. There is a light, there is a fire that falls on me as in the upper room, destroying all carnality, dispelling fear and gloom. gloom. There is a love constraining me to go and seek the lost. She had a curvature of the spine like a mother had. She went to her daddy, the founder of the army, and said, Daddy, and he kicked everybody out of his office. Go to another country, don't stay in England. Get out of dark England, go to another country. She went and told her daddy, I'm going to France. Darling, you can't go to France. You're your mother's frailty. She spoke French better than the French. I'm going. She gathered some society ladies, ladies that never even put up their own hair. And they took a basement. I saw a picture of a, a bunch of Maranatha singers the other week. They'd been to France, dancing in front of Notre Dame Cathedral. And they said they were so accepted. Did you ever know a dance scared the devil? Do you have to go to a Bible school for months to learn how to dance in front of a heathen temple? These women went and they rented a basement and packed it. The greatest prostitutes in town came. The greatest, most brilliant scholars in the Sorbonne came. And they sat there and at night they said at the altar call, men would reach down and pull out revolvers, pull out knives and leave them there. One night the queen of the underworld came in. 
big, fat, voluptuous woman. And when they started to sing, she lit up her skirts and danced. The Marisol said, my dear, do you want to dance? He said, sure. She said, okay, pull all the forms back. And she said, come on, get some music going. And she said, there's one condition. We'll play the music, you dance for 20 minutes, and then I preach for 40 minutes. But like me, she didn't believe in clocks. They dance for 20 minutes, she preached for over an hour and 20 minutes, and the altar was lined. And the whole of Paris was shaken through one little woman who was filled with the Holy Ghost. No financial backing in a dirty slum area as bad as anything Wilkinson's in now. Every other woman on the street was a prostitute. Everybody else was drunk and malicious. They hardly go out at night. They went. It's all right to sing in church and feel sweet. All oh, the angels camp round about you. What do you need angels round here for? Nobody will pick your pocket. <laughs> they went to the underworld. Why, she said, there is a love constraining me to go and seek the lost. I yield, O oh Lord, my all to thee to save at any cost. There is a fire that falls on me as in the upper room, destroying all carnality. Listen, you can't lead to people to victory if you're not in victory yourself. That's hypocrisy. You can't preach purity if there's inward defilement. The whole of a revival in America is not in the parents or the movie house, it's in God's house. There's so much carnality, so much unbelief, so much indifference, God help us, while the world perishes outside. But you see, Paul says, the love of Christ, not love for Christ, but God is love. The love of God has come into my heart. The love of Jesus. Do you remember that hymn of Edwin Hatches? Breathe on me, breath of God, fill me with life anew, that I may love what thou dost love and do what thou dost do. Breathe on me, breath of God, till I am wholly thine, till all this earthly part of me glows with thy fire divine. That was Edwin Hatch. In a prosperous church in England, packed every Sunday, plenty of money, but he said there's no moving of God. He snatched a piece of paper and wrote that hymn. He left his fashionable church and went to Canada for a while and headed up a Bible school. But you see his, his, his desire there? Breathe on me, breath of God. Don't tell me you have to go to the upper room to do signs and wonders and miracles. Forget it. They did every miracle before Pentecost. They did after. Jesus came and breathed on them in the upper room and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And witness, uh, Wesley calls that the witness of the Spirit. And then he said, Tarry, but before you, before you, tar before you go, tarry. And not only tarry, wait for the promise of the Father. Dear God, what a day that must have been. What do you think it was like in that upper room? They weren't nervous like they were before Jesus came. They were nervous uh, after the resurrection, weren't they? In the upper room, gathered together for fear of the Jews. They weren't nervous when they saw him ascend. They went back with great joy. They were rejoicing every step of the way, every day of the countdown. They've been now waiting 28, 38, 40, 50, I don't know, 36 or 37, only 50 days and the Holy Ghost is coming. What a difference. Somebody has said there was only one church in the New Testament. Look what they did. Dear God, I had an American theologian in my office not too long ago. I said, I've just been reading that book on the Zuzer Street. On the second page, on the, on the fly leaf, it says, there are now 70 million classical Pentecostals in the world. And he said, not 70 million? No, he said, 120 million. I almost took my finger in his eye. I said, listen, were there 120 million in the upper room? What's the difference between their baptism and ours? What does the man on the street care if you speak Chinese or anything else? There's a cripple at the door. What are you going to do? Jesus passed that cripple hundreds of times. Peter passed him. There came a moment when it would glorify God to heal him. So Peter went and said, Silver and gold I have none. So he knew he wasn't an evangelist. He knew he wasn't a pope. <laughs> and then he said, Such as I have give I unto thee. So he knew he wouldn't be a pope again. But he goes to that twisted, tormented man. Everybody in town knew him. Listen, some young evangelist came to a town called Blackburn in England when I was a boy, and there's a man at the street corner blind. He would steal for his money and sell his newspapers. 
and somebody took him into a meeting where not Stephen and Edward Jeffries, the son of Stephen was there. They brought him in the meeting and he prayed for him and suddenly his eyes were opened. My dear neighbour came back yesterday, he's a prodigal son, he goes away and comes back now and again. Tim, and he was telling me, he'd been to Western Canada, everybody's looking here. Oh, if you knew there was going to be a moving of the Spirit, where would you be? You'd be there. Yes. So we go to the ends of the earth. There'd been a meeting, what, in Western Canada with the Indians, wasn't it, Tim? And one young lady got full of the Holy Ghost and the joy of the Spirit, and she said, was it to a preacher? I've got to see my granddad. And they drove her to see a grandpa. When she got in the hospital, the doctor said, no, no, I've got to see my grandpa. He's in, the, he's in the room, he's dead, he's laid dead. I've certified him dead. I've got to see my grandpa. You can't see a grandpa. She pushed the doctor on one side, bless her. She went in, took the cover off his feet, took his hand, took his feet in her hands and prayed for him, and the dead grandpa got up. Hallelujah. And the doctor didn't say, well, he wasn't really dead, you know. You know, with his poor, tormented little pride. He had to admit it. I said, I'd like to take it with me. Every church I go in, the rows of dead people. <laughs> hmm. Let me put a commercial in here. Sunday, is it this Sunday, Martha, we go? There's a church called Birchman Baptist Church in Dallas. They've had six weeks of nightly revival and I'm to go there Sunday night. I'm not excited there'll be a thousand people there. I say there'll be maybe 200 seminary students. So boy, there's a chance to preach. I'll feel like Ezekiel. Can these dried brains live? <laughs> then, after that, next morning I to speak to a hundred or more Baptist pastors. That's a challenge. Then the Wednesday night goes to the Anchor Church, which is a church I think about three or four years old that uh, Jack Taylor raised up. So I've got a full load next week, pray, because I'm not that strong physically, mentally sure. So what a chance to serve the Lord. Paul says, the love of Christ constraineth me. I don't know the verse, but you know it. What did it say? You see, he believed, John 3, 16, God so loved the world. He also believed and wrote in Ephesians, Christ loved the church. But you know it's more wonderful? Do you know why he left the ivory palaces for the world of war? Do you know why he left the blinding glory of eternity where cherubim and seraphim bowed down before him? Why did he do it? To leave that glory, indescribable majesty of eternity and get shut up in the belly of a young Jewish girl? Why did he do it? Because he said he loved me, that's why he did it. He loved me. Oh, we sing it, we don't mean it. Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, my life, my all. It's only verbiage, verbal. He said he loved me. That's why he understood, that's why he put up with the contradiction of sinners. That must have been amazing. I read the other day that marvelous verse, is it? I don't know how often you explode when you read the word. I've read this, I guess, 70 years. And it says at the beginning of John chapter uh, 13 of John, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world unto the Father, having loved his own. He loved them unto the end. What's this man talking about? The Apostle Paul had a joy unspeakable, a faith unshakable and a love unbreakable. And that's why he conquered where other men failed. That's why he went where other men stopped. He says, I have a home eternal in the heavens. What makes him so sure? Because Jesus said in John 14, I go to repair a place for you. So he knew I had a home eternal in the heavens. The second thing, he was caught up to the third heaven. What did he see? He doesn't tell us. Do you think when he was caught up, and I don't know how long he was there, a day or a week or a month, do you think he had a preview of the marriage supper of the Lamb? Do you think he had a preview of all the marching millions coming through the skies, led by Jesus Christ? There was something 
That's why you can torture him, beat him, starve him, put him in prison, do as you like. I don't care, I have a home eternal in the heavens. Destroy this body, so what? There's something in me indestructible. I've got a home eternal in the heavens. Yes, yes, an Englishman wrote, when we've been there 10,000 years, poor guy. That's only a weekend. When we've been there 10 million years, bright shining as the sun. We no less days to sing his praise than when we first began. You see, we're so earthbound. That's our trouble, we're earthbound. Paul says, Jesus Christ loved me, and he gave himself for me. Let me ask you to skip to that amazing chapter we had last week, brother. I always call that Brother Brace's chapter. What was it? 2 Corinthians 11, listen. Before you that, step back a moment there. Do you know what this man had? I wonder if Jonathan Edwards got the idea from this when he said, God stamp eternity on my eyeballs. See everything in the focus of eternity. Makes all the difference. We're earthbound people. We see with our eyes. We think with our eyes very often. But look what he says here. Again in verse chapter 5, verse 1, if the earthly house of this tabernacle is up, we have a home eternal in the heavens. But wait a minute. Look at verse 17 of chapter 4. Our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. For we look not at the things which are seen. Do we? How much have you lived by what you've seen today? The believer doesn't do that. We look at the things that are seen. We look not at the things which are seen, but the things which are seen are temporal. But these things are eternal. He carries it over to eternal in the heavens. It's at the end of the 17th verse. This man's a joker. Is it saying? Let me get hold of that and underline it in your mind a minute. It is 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, there's no rational way to explain that. It's total insanity. It's illogical. Listen to this. Of the Jews five times received, I forty stripes saved. Is that a moment? How long does it take you to whip a man's back five times? Or, or 39 times? And do it five times over with maybe one day and two days rest and then start doing it, or weeks in between. Does it make it any easier? He's counting the strokes, they're ripping his back with a cut of nine times. It, it, it's a life that has at least five or even nine uh, lashes at the end and each of them has a spike of copper and that cuts more than glass and they rip his back and he's counting, oh, only two more, and then this is over. They put him on one side into a lousy prison and say, listen, two days you're going to get another lot. Then a third time, then a fourth time, then a fifth time. Is that a moment? I like to is that light affliction? Dear God, it would kill most of us once. Never mind, five times. Paul would send a begging letter. I need to go to California for a month or Florida. My, my poor back is so sore, and I'm lame, and I'm this, and I'm the other. We'd sing a song of sorrow. And Paul sums it all up as it's a joke. Our light affliction, what's the light affliction? I was beaten once. Once I was stoned. You see, it's a moral universe. He stood one day, and he watched a man stoned to death. I guess the first time a stone hit his head, he wondered why people didn't interfere. He didn't interfere, he let he let Stephen get stoned to death. And you see the wonder of this. He says, the love of Christ. Do you know why? Because this man met Jesus. Jesus had nail prints in his hands. And this part Pharisee had bloody hands. He tore up families. He kicked them out of their homes. He kicked them out of their cities. He was a pharaoh. He was a Hitler. And yet Jesus in mercy didn't destroy him. He came in mercy there. He would have sung, mercy there was great and grace was free, wouldn't he? 
He would have sung, And can it be that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood? Died he for me who caused this pain, for me who him to death pursued? Amazing love, how can it be that thou, my God, shouldst die for me? He left his Father's throne above, so free, so infinite his grace, emptied himself of all but love and bled for Adam's helpless race. Do you wonder again he sings, Tis mercy all, immense and free, for oh my God, it found out me. You see, the thing that stunned him was this. I guess when he first met Jesus, Mary was in his corruption, in his sin. He had, he'd heard Jesus say this, he, he did it by the what, scripture he read, that Jesus said, I came not to call the righteous. Here's a man that's righteous from his toes to his head, according to the law, he says. I'm as righteous as any man on earth. Well, Jesus, I don't come for the righteous. But then he suddenly realizes, as he visualizes, as he sees Jesus, not visualizes, he sees him. Can you imagine Jesus, le Jesus leaving the throne and coming and standing on that robe for one man? Did anybody, I've never heard anybody say this, maybe Bill Brace, you have. I think there was one of the greatest shouts of hallelujah, I think three great days in the early church, one, well, um, maybe more. One was when Jesus was born, and the old people knew about that, because they were there. The second was when Jesus died. The third was when Jesus rose from the dead. The fourth, when, have you heard the news? What news? Well, the man that's been killing your grandfathers, and your mothers, and your uncles, and burning our churches, he got saved. Hallelujah. Saul of Tarsus, never. He blasphemed Christ. And yet God takes hold of him. You know, I believe that as long as the Apostle Paul lived, angels were delirious at his ministry, and demons were, what we should call them, terrified. He's he, he such an immense view of the love of God. Oh my God, it found out me. But he says, these things are what? Our light affliction, here's the light affliction. Perils of the waters, is that a moment? Perils of the deep, is that a moment? Perils by the brethren, is that a moment? Perils in the city, perils in the wilderness. Can we get to a wilderness in a moment? It's only a moment compared to eternity. What is it? As my dear wife said today, well then, you know, some of the great joys, they only last a minute, and some of the great sorrows only last a minute. There's a lady in England, one of those wonderful old ladies, and she's not, never up or down, she's always the same. A new preacher came along and asked her, what's the secret of your... They, they say you're always balanced, you never get bowled over, you never get too heavy, you, never, you don't go up too high. What's the secret of your life? Oh, she said, I love that scripture. What scripture? It came to pass. Well, that guy knew Greek, but he didn't know that. Well, that's it, it came to pass. Why do you get so heavy? You get pondering, up, pondering over something and it worries you. Why don't you do the same way with your joys? We spend more time over our adversity and calamity. This man says, well, in perils of the deep, in perils of the deep, let me go right across the page quickly here, into the 12th chapter, listen. Do you know why he does this? Do you know why he's happy to be whipped? He says, because the Master says, my grace is sufficient for you. He give us more grace as the burdens go greater. He give us more strength as the labors increase. To add an affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiply trials, he multiplies peace. His love has no limit, his grace has no measure, his power has no boundary, known unto men. But out of the fullness of blessing in Jesus, he give us and give us and give us again. There is no limit. So listen to what he says, this reckless man. Here in the 12th chapter of 2nd Chronicles, Corinthians. He said unto me, My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. He said that in the previous chapter, and verse 30, If I must needs glory, I will glory in my infirmities. We glory in our successes. We glory in our blessings. Those who came to a Friday night class heard me pray many times. We had we 500 Friday nights. I think I missed five of them. And I would say again and again in my despairing prayer, Lord, when I get to heaven and there are billions of people there, 
don't point me out before the apostles and prophets and saints of all the ages. Many were martyred, many were dismembered. All the heroes of Hebrews 11, don't point me out with Paul and Peter and all the saints looking on and say, Ravenel, when you were in Texas, I had many things to tell you, but you couldn't bear them. People say, brother, brother, cast all your burden on the Lord. Who does God cast his burden on? He doesn't need to. He's, he's omnipresent and omniscient and everything. He does. He says, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. But he doesn't give some of us burden. Dear God, we get upset and offended over nothing. This man says, I glory in infirmities. I've hardly met a man in my life. I've met some strange and wonderful people. I've hardly ever met a man who said, Lord, pour it all on me. Give me a double portion. We all want a double portion of joy, a double portion of blessing. And the only way God can prove his gospel to this generation is when we get into some hell hole and there's no way out. You can't back out. You can't go to the right or left. No man can be living on your hang on. I believe there are men and women like this in, in China tonight. There are men and women in the prisons in Russia tonight. They haven't had a bath for months. They haven't had a decent meal. They don't know what it is to get a night's rest. Didn't Solomon hit them? That one of the most amazing men of our generation. Didn't he say that the thing that turned him to God was the man across the prison he was in would feel in his clothes at night and unroll some bits of paper and read what was there and then roll them up and put them back. And he asked him one day, he said there was human filth running around the place and he said they doubled the burden on that man, twice as hard a burden, gave him less food, persecuted him beyond the rest of them and he said the man never lost his joy. And I wanted to know why. He said, because I have God. Amen. I have Christ in me. Amen. Paul says, listen, whip me. There's something in you can't kill it with whipping. Throw me in the sea. You can't drown it. I've got a fire nothing on earth can put out. Hallelujah. I want to prove God to the last degree. And therefore, he says, most gladly, therefore, most gladly will I glory in my infirmities. Now listen to this. I take pleasure in my love offerings, in my popularity, in the many epistles I've written, in my fame. No, I got that. That's a, an evangelist of the road. <laughs> what do they say? I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions. No, no, no. God loves you so much, dear friend. He just never want to see a tear drop from your face. The Bible says he stores them up in heaven, in his bottle. Jesus wept, Paul wept. As I told you, this man knew every conceivable trial. He knew every emotion. He was torn out when his revival party. Spiritual men all forsook him. That, that's hard to bear. He was torn up when he, when he prayed, as he did in, the, in, in Romans uh, chapter 9. Okay. I take place in infirmities, reproaches, necessities, persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. You see that? He's not, you see, see, this man won't give the devil an inch. Where's Paul? He's in prison. Oh, I'll tell you what, that Pharaoh, somebody should kill, not Pharaoh, Caesar. Paul, the man of God. Paul, the man that's walked the streets of heaven, had a revelation like nobody else on earth, and he's the prisoner of Caesar. He doesn't say that. He won't give the devil credit. He doesn't say, I'm the prisoner of Caesar. I'm the prisoner of the devil. He says, I'm the prisoner of Jesus Christ. If he orders my steps, he orders my stops. But don't make any mistake. You might have said to Paul, well, you must be very lonely in that prison. He said, no, I'm alone, but I'm not lonely. I will never leave you or forsake thee. What do you think when he was washed up and down? Well, uh, let me say this again. That 13th chapter of John, read it when you go home. Having loved his disciples, he loved them to the end. Don't you think they were a torment to him? Don't you think Judas often pilfered the money? Don't you think Thomas often doubted him? Don't you think Peter often blew up in anger? And he, he, right to the end, he loves them. He loved them so much that when he's facing the cross, he takes the towel and washes somebody's feet. And Peter says, no. Poor petulant pre Peter. Why? The answer of Jesus is amazing. The answer of Jesus is this. What thou doest, thou knowest not now, 
but thou shalt know hereafter. You're looking for an answer to your problem. Forget it. God trusted you with it. What you, he does now, you don't know. You'll know hereafter. What thou doest now, what I do, you don't know. You'll know hereafter. Listen, I'm going back to that word where Paul says, right the, the Lord is coming with 10,000 of his saints. Who's going to lead them? Jesus. Who comes after them? Maybe the archangels. Maybe the saints. Of all the, and there's Peter. Well, Lord, I don't understand it then. I understand it now. Mm-hmm. Part of the heavenly host. Dear God, we'll end there. I'll be embarrassed in heaven. How often we've doubted God. <coughs> People ask me, would you ask the Lord to take this off me? No, he put it on you. He put it on you. The devil can't stick something on you. He came to Job. Isn't it wonderful? God says to the devil, have you considered my servant Job? Do you think he ever says, have you considered my servant Sonny? Or is it just says that of Job? Nobody like him in the earth. Isn't that a testimony? Well, he says, look, I'll tell you what it is. It's this. This is what the devil says. You put a hedge round him. Take the hedge away. And the Lord says, no. I'll tell you what I will do. I'll pull it in a bit nearer. So then the devil goes round and destroys everything he can. What does he do? He goes to bed a mul- Job goes to bed a multimillionaire, wakes up bankrupt in the morning. What was the first thing he did? Sent him bankrupt. Yes, but you've got that hedge right. Let me touch him. No. I'll pull it in a bit clo- closer. So the devil goes on rampages again. What did he su- do the first time? He sent him bankruptcy. What did he do the second time? He sent him bereavement. He killed all his family. Yes, but you still have a hedge around him. And the Lord says, you can do all he has, but you can't touch his soul. Bereavement, bankruptcy, bereavement, Go on then, I'll take the hedge away. So then poor old Jeb, Joel gets boil, boiled. He can't sit down, he can't stand up, he scratches himself, and his gracious friends came. Wonderful. We've all got friends like these. Job's wonderful friends. Eliphaz the Temanite. Bill had a shoe height. He was a dwarf, he was only a shoe height. <laughs> <coughs> So they all come round, and just like the devil, he took all that he had and left him with a nagging wife. <laughs> His wife came in and said, listen, curse God and die. You know, the Hebrew says, blaspheme God and commit suicide. What can you prove? What kind of a God is this? You've lost your millions, you're bankrupt, you're all your family's washed out, you're bereaved, your body's broken, quit! Dear God, I'm going to see Job and talk to him a million years, I think. He jumps on the ash heap there, and he says, Listen, even if worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Hallelujah. What do you do with a man like that? As a faith unshakable, a joy unspeakable, and a love unbreakable. I know that everything's in the hand of God. Yes, God is prospering me. What if he takes it all away? How many businessmen do you think you are in Russia today? Or Afghanistan, they watch everything collapse? Or in China? And that's what's happened. What does Paul say? All men forsook me. He means those men that uh, were on the revival party of the Apostle Paul. All men forsook me. Nevertheless, he says, the Lord stood by me. And sometimes the only way you can see God, it's like looking at a building. I remember being in the Orient, and I saw a building, and the, build, the scaffolding outside wasn't made of metal, it was bamboo. It looked as though it cut a forest down. There was an awesome building covered with bamboo. The next time I saw it, two or three years after, all the bamboo had gone. I'll tell you what, the building was very different without the bamboo. And sometimes God has to take all the scaffolding away. Isn't there a statement made now that maybe whatever money you give to missions uh, next year instead of getting a hundred percent tax deductible you only get forty percent that's going to cut a lot of giving down a lot of people are going to suffer lots of people aren't giving their money they're giving government money it's going to come to an end we're going to be tested on every level <coughs> well i'm enjoying this i don't know what you're doing i don't care Oh, 
oh that's glorious our light affliction worketh for us an exceeding eternal weight of glory we look at the things we've seen the things we've seen are temporal the things we've not seen are eternal see he gets it in three times twice there and once in the first verse is eternity conscious all my life is oriented now around eternity sure God's doing his chiseling and his hammering for what? to shape me for eternity the only reason you're lying on earth is to prepare for eternity now let me look at the clock a minute I hate clocks let me quote the scriptures I want to really get to now I said that, and I mean it there, that I believe that one of the strong parts about the life of the Apostle Paul was that he knew that constant love of God. I don't believe love is an attribute of God, it's the nature of God. How many, how many letters did the Greeks have for, for love, Brother Bracey? Four? Four. We have one. One word for love. Oh, I love my husband. I love my dog. Maybe it's the same love. Except the, except the dog gets more attention than the husband usually. <laughs> oh dear, dear, dear. It said, oh. Oh, I love hamburgers. I hate them. Oh, I love this. I love that. I love, it's one word that we use all the time. The Greeks have different words for love. And the strongest is agape. God's love. God so loved. Acts, uh, what? Uh, John 3, 16. That love. And it's that love, and only that love, that will take me. What did Wesley call it? Charles Wesley called it love divine, all love excelling. Take all the romantic stories that you have ever read or could read, and yet the story of his love, where God is contracted to a span, where the one the heaven of heavens can't contain him, and yet he's crammed into the womb of the woman. I said and I get challenged about it, I mean it. I don't care what church you go to. A church that doesn't have the supernatural is superficial. You don't have to cartwheel down the aisles or do some other things. There's a breeding of God and you know. And I'm convinced that if I was as sensitive and you were to God, we'd be satisfied to go sit in a meeting for an hour until we feel God is moving and then soon he gets up and gives a scripture soon he gets up and recites a, a, a verse of a hymn and then the presence of God comes in an unmistakable majesty I believe if I were as sensitive to God as I should be I would leave every meeting either with tears of joy down my face that the high and lost one who inhabits eternity has been in the meeting or have a broken heart or, or heart over the lost world that's going to hell fire but somehow we're not we're not moved Now here's the whole secret of Paul's life. 